barbecue capital of the world and home of Elvis Presley. Please welcome your co-host, Bob Furness. A contact center job either finds you in a moment of need right. or you find it in a moment of need, right? Uh, I need a job. And, uh, and, and Or it could be that I'm, I'm working to be an opportunity in a contact center. And from the tornado capital of the world, home of the Oklahoma Sooners, here's your co-host, Amas Tanuma. Welcome to the show. I am your co-host, Amas Tanuma, and I've got my friend and partner in crime, Bob Furness. Bob, good morning. Good to see you, man. Morning, Amas. Great to see you also, sir. This is the uh, best hour of the week and yep. where we get to t- talk about contact centers and whatever you guys send to us. So let's jump right in. I want to talk about leadership today. Is leadership nature or nurture? Is it just that some people are good at this leadership thing and they can only get better and some people are terrible and they can only graduate from terrible to bad? Uh, what do you what do you think makes good good leaders? I've read some stuff about your childhood influence in that. What's your view on? Because we we need leaders, particularly in in customer experience and in the contact center. So so the one of the, one of the cool things about watching or, or hanging out with us is there's some consistency, and you always give me two either two good answers or two bad answers, and expect <laughs> me to choose one or the other. The answer is yes again. The oh. answer. Is there it nurture there's, or nature? Yes, it's both. But you, but what's there, important is there was can, an or. There was can, an or in my question. An or is irrelevant. <laughs> okay. you, it's and. It's and nurture. So here, here's a cool story. I was I'm I'm cleaning out my attic. I'm I'm at the age where I know that there's a whole bunch of stuff in my attic that my son is going to throw away when I die. <laughs> he's not he's not even going to look at it, right? I, he's not even going to take it. the whole box. I mean, I found, I found I found a box of Beanie Babies that were going to make us a lot of money that are no longer worth anything. I did find a couple that I looked up online that are in the original that say they're worth a lot of money. But I digress and I'm off topic. I found a box of stuff that I held on to. And one of them was um, a cursey test or a, a, a personality test. Mm. And what I found is. I was an ESFJ in 1993. You know what's crazy is I took that test, 93, what is that, 30 years? Yeah. I took that test again the other day or, or last last month. I was an ENFJ, EN, ESFJ. 30 years later, I tested at the same, all of the books I've read, all the things I've done, all the training I've done, ah. all the, I, I could not believe that it, that it nailed me. I went back and looked at my my test from last week and I c- couldn't believe it. Now, what that tells me is there is some reality to nurture, to, to, to nature. There's some reality that, but you know what? You don't have to be a type A personality to be a great leader. No. It, you don't have to be, you can be a, a quiet leader, uh, a, a quiet, rational uh, leader. In fact, you draw people to you sometimes when you're that kind of leader because you're typically empathetic and you're and I think about if you think about so you're out there in in uh in radio land our podcast land think about who's on your supervisor team right now and you think about what their personality is and you've got a Connie who's a quiet strong female leader you've got an Amy who's an, a a a hard nose type A get it done leader. You've got a Scott who's a, uh, uh, an amiable music loving, let's, let's get together. Let's, let's be happy leader. So right. you're not leadership is, it can be learned and, and how it's learned. Those people with their nature have the ability to be better at their craft of leadership. And so if you're reading, if you're going to, if you're going on LinkedIn and doing uh, training sessions, if you're following the right people on Twitter, you can learn to be a better leader. There's no doubt in my mind. And I know because I know what a bad leader I was in comparison to what my mindset is from 1993. But wow, that's, that's, 
I've hopefully gotten better as a leader. Yeah, well, I I I too can um, give testament to that. In in that, you know, I think back to where I learned my sort of basic leadership from, and part of my learning was from learning what not to do. So I, I just got to think. Yes, my theory has always been there's nature can give you a head start, right? Uh, versus others, right? That's that's the that's the reality of life, right? We all are blessed in different ways, but there are enough tools and people that would teach you to hone in your skills that can get you as high as you're willing to to work to be. But I'd love for you to talk about if if someone's listening to this and they're thinking about, you know, I want to sort of improve my leadership skills. You've said you've gotten better over the years. How did that happen specifically? Um, was was the genesis self awareness? So you knew your did you work on your weaknesses versus your strengths? How did what was your journey like as you as you made it a mission to want to lead people both formally or in a matrix way? Well. So anytime you get an opportunity to 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 listen or to read from somebody who is is talking about leadership, take that opportunity. I mean, I, I think about, you know, the church I was going to at, the, at a time had a, a, a session that you could sign up for. And it was a combination of John Maxwell and um, who, who wrote Who Moved My Cheese? Uh, Blanchard, Ken right. Blanchard, uh, they were on a, a session that was really about, I don't know, a, about ministry, but they were talking about how John Maxwell had been in the in the secular world or in the church world and had become a secular uh, speaker and how Ken Blanchard had been in the uh, church world and are in the secular world and become a church speaker. And so that was the but but wow, I think about what I got out of that, uh, looking back right. and listening to these guys talk about the the impact of leadership and how you have to take people from where they are to where they want to be, and it, it was it was those kind of moments. So don't miss those moments. Don't miss an opportunity to get on the. I mean, TED Talk. Goodness, oh, yeah. just. Go, go. You Simon got 20 Sinek. minutes, 20 minutes yeah. at a time. If you get up from a session with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Brene, Brown. Brene Brown, if you yeah. get up from a session with Brene Brown and you don't go put something into into action the next day, then you're not, not a better leader. Yeah. Right. You're not intentional about it. <laughs> so um, how, how did I how did I do that? I, I, I look back at the moments in that same box was were all the certificates from the 90s of, of sessions I'd been in. And I'm like, wow, I, I don't remember that. I don't even remember going to that session on leadership. I went to a session about diversity that yeah. has formed, that was the catalyst of forming my brain around uh, my blind spots and right. a whole lot of diversity. We, we watched the movie, uh, um, can't think of the name of it. Uh, with Gene Gene um, Hackman, Hackman, Hustler, um, Hoosiers, Hoosiers, yeah, and and we took apart Hoosiers from a diversity perspective and how yeah. the the uh, the race that was issues that were built into it and all of those and, and and I think about what an impact that day had on my perspective of of diversity. So take those opportunities, and it's really easy in this world. To get so busy that you don't have time for it, but yeah. but but find time, schedule time, take time, find time. I I I I I would just concur and just say, guys, the beauty about leadership is, it's it's applicable, right? It's transferable, right? So if you you don't have to just look for leadership wherever, military leadership, anyone who is talking about leadership, it's a skill that's universal. It's the same leadership skills that you use in a contact center, in, in a in in a war zone, because uh, I've listened to all kinds of I I too like Bob just consume anything about how do you how do you lead lead people whether formally or informally. Uh, let's switch gears. I want to tell you about uh, 
think last week you shared a wonderful, beautiful story of Chewy.com. And I think everyone who's listened to that show is now a Chewy.com customer. <laughs> how, how can you how can you not? But today I want to tell you about uh, a different story. So this is um, about the Postal Service, um, you know, one of those courier services. So I'll paraphrase the story. So customers having an issue, they have misplaced this package. Da, da, da. So you do the whole thing where you email the executives of the company. So we all know what happened. Well, maybe we all don't know. Those of us on the inside know what happens with those emails. That email gets forwarded to a team or bot. Hey, you guys handle this. Da, da, da. Well. In this case, the CEO, one of their responses was, someone also please tell her to uh, expletive off. Uh, you can fill in the gaps here. But what the CEO didn't realize was the customer was copied <laughs> in that string. No, no, no. The, the string of email gets forwarded to the customer in, in the resolution of it. So now, as you can imagine, the customer now knows what you think of them uh, when they, when you think they're not listening. So I would love to hear your your reaction to to this in general. And what advice would you give to <laughs> companies who are dealing with things like this? So first of all, always be careful what you say because you never know who's listening, right? That, that's that, Ale Alexa what, what, is listening. <laughs> Absolutely. She's listening right now, I'm sure. And I probably will have an ad on my phone from Chewy.com by the end of the day uh, because she's listening. Um, but if you're going to be careful what you say, be careful what you write even more. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> and um, I, I, I've recently had somebody on my team that uh, should have followed the 12 hour rule. Mm. And that here's what the 12 hour rule is it's it's Thursday afternoon and you got an email from somebody and it, it, it ticked you off. Right. It, it, it hit a nerve. So you right. type back an answer and it involves right. slicing the keys, right? <laughs> right? Now what you should do is do this and close your laptop, walk away for 12 hours and come back and read your response and then hit send. I'm not telling you not to always never hit send, but I bet you you change some wording overnight uh, by the next morning before you hit send. So number one is use that 12 hour rule, 15 hour rule, whatever the rule is, but, but don't send something like that. If you're using something that you didn't want your mom to read, you might want to not send it. Uh, so, uh, but even, the opposite of that is something that I, I don't know where I came up with this or who told me this, but early in my career, I worked at Greyhound bus lines and you've never had a customer service issue as you have when somebody has lost your luggage and you're not going to get your luggage or your luggage. We don't know where your luggage is. So there, there's nothing better than that. But for some reason, I got in this mode where no matter how bad the situation, I'm going to make them laugh. I, I'm going to get them on my side because, or I'm going to go get on their side, right? There is, there shouldn't be a side. So, so what that CEO did is it, it, the customer may have been wrong. It may have not have been their fault. It may have been an issue, but the, the, the CEO made it about uh, sides. Tell them we're right. Yeah, you can. Go you off <laughs> right. um, versus, hey, how do we get on their side? How do we respond to them? Yeah, so we are. sort of sort of customer service 101. It, and, um, you, you know, know we talked talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, about the number of views for uh, United lost uh, United lost my car. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, Listen, you just can't. You don't want to be famous for an email, right? For, that's, for that. that's the and, last thing you want to be famous for. And this is what I, I tell, you know, you know, we get into conversations with clients who talk about, I don't want to trust my people to send emails. Well, I, someone should take the CEO's email box. <laughs> 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 because, because uh, talk about that. Let, let's, uh, let's move on to questions. 
Uh, this was a long. By the way, where do you find these things, man? You just keep coming up with them every single week. Uh, the, these guys, <laughs> this is yeah. a, this is a long one. So, so the dirty little secret, Bob, is I am dozens of emails behind from the old season. <laughs> like I am like like it's dozens of emails behind from the old season. Okay. So, right. um, they're still worth answering. So this is a this is a longer one. But this is really focused on. Her boss wants to do a flexible shift. So let me let me let me let me read the question. We are about to implement flexible shifts for the fourth time. Any ideas how to make this work? So I I did engage because I was curious. So I, I got a very length, <laughs> lengthy email. But the gist of it, Bob, is her boss believes it's the right thing to do and must have read it somewhere, maybe in contacts on a pipeline about <laughs> flexible shifts is the way to go. It makes people happy. She's not for it, let's let's be clear, but she's being made to implement it. So her comment about the fourth time is designed to say, look, we've tried this before and every time it fails, service level issues, what have you. So I, I think in two minutes, you, you, we can't do a whole lot in a couple of minutes. In a couple of minutes, we'd love for you to give her some thoughts around, in general, uh, what do we think may have gone wrong I believe in the idea. I believe in giving agents flexibility, but I but I think it has to be done in a way that makes sense. So we don't have time on this show to diagnose everything that's wrong. Maybe we should bring her on. Uh, everything that's wrong with the show, but then she's got to show her face and tell the whole world she's not really. <laughs> she's so lucky that you haven't said her name yet because you <laughs> by accident. So. I should stop talking then. Stop because talking. Before that's you that's say. how it happens. Absolutely. Because I keep talking and next thing you know, I, I read her first and last name. But yeah, what, what do you think? It's so number one, what's the definition of success and what's the definition of failure? Hmm. So if it fell three times, why did it fail? And be specific. And is that definition of failure? the only definition that matters. So if if the definition of failure is I got 65 calls on hold because 20% of my staff are, are six, 60 calls on hold because 50% of my staff decided to go home early, right. that's a problem. Right. We have to correct that. But do you throw out the, 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 the good with the bad? Correct it how? Correct it by changing a policy, changing a process. Um, so the two words that came to mind with me are, are communication and transparency. Mm -hmm. And and the place that I've seen this work was in a place where it was not implemented by the organization. It was implemented by the employees. And, and the difference is, here's my employee team. And here's what we have to accomplish. We have to accomplish this kind of service level, this kind of wait time. Here's here's how many people we it says we need to have in butts and seats. So you guys, if this, this is the criteria, how do we do this? And what do we do when three people have, have asked off for this afternoon, but three people called in sick? Right. What's the process? What do we do about that? And the buy-in from the employee has a better chance to engage in the bad times and take credit for the good times. So it's the only time that I've ever heard of somebody being successful is when it was it was at least designed by an employee committee. That doesn't mean you can't put parameters around it. That doesn't mean everybody's going to go home on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. That means right. that the people that are Im implementing it have to know everybody can't go home at three o'clock on Friday afternoon. So how do we how do we build a system that that allows us to meet our customers' needs? Because that's the reason why you have a job. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. I I think I think that last part is so key. If your employees are bought into it, you know I, I think you and I have stories. You know, um, you know, you've got the you've got the old school bathroom but in the end employees are conscientious they know they know 
how many calls are in, in queue. They're conscientious, but you have to give them ownership of it. Um, if not, then you're correct, right? There will be this, I don't have ownership to it. This is not my And then there are some employees who don't want this, right? Making sure everyone's voices are heard and transparency and communication, I think, is top of the funnel for this. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I agree. And 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 by the way, whoever wrote the, the question, her name not to be shared, um, it's a whole lot more detailed than what we just talked about. Of course. I, I think what you're doing is easy. Yes. But, but, but have you thought about letting your employees help make their rules? Yeah. Yeah. I, I listen, it's, it's a tough one to crack, uh, but it's one that's worth, it's worth it. I've seen models of this that, that, that work. I, I will say tactically, you do need a fate, a foundational base for this to work. Like there needs to be a staff. And I bet you not everyone wants this flexible shift. There are people who like consistency. So if you can capitalize and then make them be your, your steady eddy band and then put flex, yeah, and then put flexibility around it, that might be one way to go. But hopefully we gave you some stuff that was helpful. We made this deal before. I think Bob has said this a few times where it's like, if we didn't answer your question, shoot us back. I don't get a lot of takers on it. So I'll take that as we are answering your questions. <laughs> I've I've got it on. So let's go to words of wisdom. Uh, this this week, this this quote isn't uh, isn't mine. It's um, in God we trust. Everyone else bring data. And this is another deal again. Back to, to go to your question about schedules. When you say it's failed three times, but what's the data on that? Is that an opinion of someone who thinks it fails? Uh, so I've always loved this quote. I think it's by Demon. Uh, in God, we trust everyone else to bring bring data because you know we've made lots of decisions and anecdotes, and um, hard data is usually a better way to, to to go about it. Bob, what about you? There's three kinds of lies. There's lies, damn lies, and there's statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who said that either, but but it's true. So analyze your statistics like back to the very first conversation about the voice of the customer a, a, a couple of shows ago it's in the details the data so so bring the data but bring me bring me the data you can make data say whatever you want it to say so so analyze the data understand the data and then make decisions based on what the outcomes of the data are but wow, we have so much data. I think back to how much data we had in our contact centers in our printed, uh, you know, our d -d 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 printers back in eighty in the eighties. And I look at how much data we have today, and I'm 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 just overwhelmed with how much there is. The question is, what are you? What are you? Uh, and we should do a show on data. What are you? Uh, what are you reporting on, and why? Is it because you're going to change something if it's good or, or, or improve something if it's good or change something if it's bad? But um, but yeah. data data is good, but it, it also can say whatever you want it to say. I guarantee you I can take your data and help you improve by adding employees to your call center or taking away from your call center. <laughs> same data, same decision. <laughs> well, I, I, we're going to have to debate that because I, I used to say men lie, women lie, and the numbers don't was an, another quote. But uh, Bob's going, ah, the, the numbers can lie too. <laughs> All right, everyone. This the numbers can lie. Not the numbers. <laughs> numbers are the numbers. Not the numbers, but the people can Absolutely. weaponize the numbers and make Absolutely. them say what they want. Absolutely. Well, it's been, a, it's been a great show. And thanks for listening, everyone. Please subscribe. Subscribe, um, shoot us an email, and uh, thoughts and criticisms are welcome. Good talking to you again, Bob, and good goodbye, everyone out there. Thank you. We want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Contact Center Show. If you would like to join the conversation, please visit us at contactcenter.tv. That is contactcenter, all one word, dot TV. Or you can simply subscribe wherever you get your podcast. This has been a Beyond Production.